Well, good morning to each and every one of you. We are going to be in the book of Micah this morning. So grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Micah. Micah chapter 5 is where we are going to be. Micah is right after Jonah and right before the book of Nahum, just in case you have any trouble finding it. Micah chapter 5. Our focus is going to begin at verse number 1, and it will extend down to verse 4 of that chapter. And so the word of God says this in the book of Micah, chapter 5, beginning at verse number 1. It says, now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. The title of this morning's message is The Royal Ruler. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are here. I'm so glad that I have yet one opportunity again to speak the word of God. I pray, Lord, that as I speak, that you would give me clarity of mind, clarity of expression. And I pray that the words of Scripture would make a significant difference in our hearts this morning. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be blessed as a result of being here in this place today. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. There are many avenues by which a Christian can prove that biblical Christianity is indeed true. One of the ways is by affirming how wonderfully and how accurately the Bible is able to foretell future events. This is officially known as the fulfillment of prophecy. One of the most recent prophecies to be fulfilled is one that concerns the state of Israel. For over 2,000 years, the Jewish people were subjected to being ruled by successive empires. They did not have an official homeland, and they lived dispersed mainly throughout the Middle East and Europe. Nevertheless, through the sovereign hand of God, on May 14, 1948, Israel once again became an official, sovereign, self-governing state. In 1948, this event took most of the world by storm. However, faithful students of the Bible were not surprised at all. They were not surprised because this event was predicted by several prophets of the Old Testament. First of all, this event was predicted by Amos. In chapter 9, verses 14 and 15 of Amos, God said this by way of the prophet Amos. He says, I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel, and they shall build the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. And notice this, he says, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, on their land. And they shall never again be rooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. Secondly, it was prophesied by Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 1, the word of God says this. It says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will, get this, bring them back to the land that I gave their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. Thirdly, this same event was also prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 12 says, he will raise a signal for the nations, and I will assemble the banished of Israel, and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four 
corners of the earth. Certainly, certainly biblical Christianity is the truth because only the God of the Bible is able to predict future events with 100% accuracy. Here in our text, in Micah chapter 5, lies another prophecy that will eventually be fulfilled. And what I want us to observe from this text of Scripture this morning is that Jesus Christ is the ruler. Capital T, capital R. Jesus Christ is the ruler who was prophesied to come in the Old Testament. How do we know this? Well, let's first notice that there is, number one, an invasion. There is an invasion. A brief glimpse is going to be given into the enemy's invasion of Israel. Chapter 5, verse 1 there. In our text, it says, Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. The word muster there means to gather together. And troops speaks to a band or an army of soldiers. So he's telling them to gather together as soldiers. He's telling them to get ready for battle because they are going to need to fight. It goes on in the text. It says, siege is laid against us. Now, the term siege refers to being enclosed, to being completely surrounded. So these people, these Israelites, have been fully surrounded by the enemy. And so now in this context, they need to prepare to fight because they are fully encapsulated by their enemies. It goes on, it says, with a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. To be struck on the cheek in Old, in old Testament times was symbolic of two things. Number one, it represented humiliation. And number two, it represented destruction, the striking on the cheek. So these people, these Israelites, these Jews would be humiliated and destroyed because of their rebellion. Because, they're, because of their sin against God as a nation, as the people of God. But before we move on, we must stop here. And we must ask two questions. Question number one, who does the they represent there in the text? And question number two, who does the judge represent there in that text? And for the answer to these two questions, we must go over to 2 Kings chapter 24. So I want you to turn with me there in your Bibles, 2 Kings chapter 24, because we are going to see who these, who these individuals represent. 2 Kings, chapter, yeah, 2 Kings chapter 24. We're going to begin reading at verse number 18. This passage of Scripture helps us to understand the context of what was taking place when Micah gave this prophecy. Verse 18 of 2 Kings chapter 24, it says, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the southern kingdom of the nation. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord, it came to the point in Jerusalem and Judea, that he cast them out from his presence. And Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Chapter 25, verse 1. It says, And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month of, on the tenth day of the month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid, here's our word, siege to it. And they built, here's our word again, Siege works all around it. Verse 2, so the city was, and the word comes up, to, up, comes up again, the city was besieged till the 11th year of King Zedekiah. And on the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city, and the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls by the king's garden. And the Chaldeans were around the city, and they went in the direction of Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king, meaning King Zedekiah, and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes and put out his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah and bound him in chains and took 
him to Babylon. So we have now a more full understanding of what was taking place when Micah, the prophet Micah, is penning this text of scripture. The they here in this verse represents King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. They are the enemy. And the judge represented here in that, this verse is the king of Judah, Zedekiah. You see, the Babylonians are under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar. And they have come in and they have sieged Jerusalem. And Zedekiah has now been struck on the cheek. He has been humiliated and destruction has been brought to his doorstep. So first of all, we saw that there is an invasion. Now, secondly, I want us to see that there is a location. A shift is now going to occur, and the center of attention is going to now shift to a certain place. Verse 2, it begins with the word, but. But is a very small word, but it makes a big difference in the Bible. Whenever you see but in the Bible, you must stop and you must take note. It shows contrast. In other words, there's going to be a shift in mood here. Previously, the mood was very dreary and depressing, but that is now going to change. Of course, as one Bible scholar has said, we must praise God for the buts of the Bible because they show a difference. So he says, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah. Now let's stop right there. The word Bethlehem or the term Bethlehem, the name Bethlehem means house of bread. And the name Ephrathah means fruitfulness. So both of these terms, Bethlehem and Ephrathah, both means that which produces much, that which produces fruit. Now, a question we must ask here is this. Why use two names? Why say Bethlehem, Ephrathah? Why not just say Bethlehem? And the reason two names are used is because there was more than one Bethlehem in the land of Israel at this time. I'm going to turn there. You don't have to turn there with me. But if we were to turn to Joshua chapter 19, in Joshua chapter 19, verses 40, verses 15 and 16, we see a record of another Bethlehem who was in, that was located in Israel. Verse 15 says, And Kata, Nahalal, Shimron, Adalah, and the next place is Bethlehem. This is the inheritance of the people of Zebulun. In other words, the tribe of Zebulun according to their clans, these cities with their villages. So there was another Bethlehem in the nation of Israel, but that was not the Bethlehem that Micah was talking about. He was not talking about the Bethlehem that was located within the tribe of Zebulun. He was talking about the Bethlehem that was located in the tribe of Judah, in the property of the tribe of Judah. And that Bethlehem was called Bethlehem Ephrathah. I want you to imagine with me that you are on a plane. Let's say you're on Aer Lingus. And you are on Aer Lingus, and this is going to be your first time coming to the nation of Ireland. And you're excited. You've never been to Ireland before. And the person sitting next to you is Irish. And as wonderful as the Irish people are, we know that they are fond of striking up a wonderful conversation. And so you and this individual get talking, and the, the person who is sitting beside you who is Irish says, where are you going? Where are you headed? Which town are you headed to in Ireland? And you, remember now, this is your first time going to Ireland. You say, I'm going to a town. I can't remember the exact name of it, but I think it begins with Bali. The person who's from Ireland would probably look you dead in the eyes and say, that doesn't help me much. Why doesn't it help you much? It doesn't help the individual much because there are so many towns around Ireland that actually begin with that name. I can maybe lift off, list off maybe four or five Bali's just from my mind right now. Bali Gar, Bali League, Bali Connell, uh, Bali Foran. There are a lot of Bali's in Ireland. There are probably a whole lot of Bali's just in Longford. You put all of the counties of Ireland together, there are probably hundreds of towns that begin with the name Bali. However, if I were to say to you, or if, that per if you were to say to that person, you're going to a certain county in Ireland, and that town begins with the name Bali, that actually narrows it down. It helps the person speculate where you may be going to. Saying Bethlehem, Ephrata, using the term Ephrata, was almost similar, not the exact same thing, but almost similar to giving the county that this town was located in. 
Everyone knew that Ephrathah was located in Judah, and it was distinct from the one that was in Bethlehem. In other words, Micah here as a prophet is leaving no room for error whatsoever. And the word of God that we've been given always hits the bullseye, dead center. It never misses the mark. It always hits the jackpot. It doesn't bear to the left. It doesn't bear to the right. It always hits things dead on the center. You can trust the Bible. You can place your confidence in the Bible because the Bible will never lead you astray. Magazines may lead you astray. The television may lead you astray. The internet may lead you astray. Your friends may lead you astray. Your family may even lead you astray. But the word of God that we've been given, the word of God will never, ever lead you astray. When Micah says, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, he's leaving no chance for a mistake regarding this particular prophecy. But the text goes on. It says, who are too little to be named among the clans of Judah? Now, the word clans there is very interesting. The word clans there literally means thousands in the original language. Now, what's the significance of this? Well, in times when this book was being written, usually every town, not all towns, but most towns, most towns in Israel would actually have had at least a thousand men in the town. And the reason most towns had a thousand men at minimum in them was so that if an enemy came and sieged the town and tried to overtake the town, these 1,000 men would need to take up arms, and they would actually need to fight and defend their town against an imposing enemy. So most towns had a thousand men, and that was their purpose. They were supposed to fight in case they were besieged by the enemy. So what this text, what this verse here is actually telling us is that Bethlehem was so small that this town did not even have 1,000 men to defend itself in case there was a siege by an enemy. In other words, Bethlehem was a very small place. It was a tiny place. Bethlehem was not the, the size of Longford. Bethlehem would maybe be equated to the size of Drumlish, if you went that direction, or if you go another direction, maybe small like Newtown Forbes. If you're familiar with the Roscommon side, maybe like Bali League and Lanesboro. Bethlehem was a very tiny place. As a matter of fact, fun fact for you, when the tribes were being named and the properties were being allotted to each and every individual tribe in the book of Joshua, the city of Bethlehem or the town of Bethlehem, can't call it a city, the town of Bethlehem was not even named amongst the cities that were allotted to the tribe of Judah. It's not even there. My point is that Bethlehem was a small insignificant place. But out of this small, insignificant place would come someone who would be the most significant person who's ever walked the face of the planet. I wonder if there's anybody here who feels insignificant. Maybe you feel you're not from a large town. Maybe you feel you're not from a large country. Maybe you feel you're not from a large family. Maybe you feel you're not from a large county. Maybe you feel ins insignificant because of the circumstances of your life. You feel that the details of your life are not that important. I want you to know that little is much when God is in it. And God is pleased to use insignificant places and insignificant people greatly for his glory. Little is much with God. So no matter how insignificant you may feel, God can take your insignificance and he could use it wonderfully. But the text goes on. It says, from you, in other words, out of this tiny insignificant town called Bethlehem, shall come forth for me. So Micah is giving this prophecy now on behalf of God. That is what the prophets did. They spoke and they spoke on God's behalf. So God is saying this person, this individual that is coming from Bethlehem, he will come on my behalf and he's also going to have my authority. Jesus Christ was sent straight from God in a way that nobody else ever has been sent from God. He was special. 
And it goes on, it says, one who is to be ruler in Israel. Now, we all know what a ruler is. A ruler is someone who has unrestricted power and unrestricted authority. When it comes to Jesus, it was never intended to be a democratic process. Jesus never needed to be voted in, and nobody is ever going to vote him out. Jesus, when it comes to Jesus, this, this is like a dictatorship. This is not a democracy. Jesus is the ruler, and no one has any right, any authority to challenge his leadership. No one in earth, no one under the earth, no one in heaven has any authority to challenge him being the ruler. And it says ruler there in Israel in the text. Now, this refers to the place where he's going to be ruling from. This is where his throne will be. But even though his throne is going to be in Israel, his rulership is going to be extended to the ends of the earth. And we're going to come to see that at the end of this verse 4. So no country is eventually going to be exempt from his leadership and from his rulership. It goes on in the text. It says, who's coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now, what does this mean? Well, I personally believe that two things are being emphasized here. Number one, when it says of old and from ancient days, it refers to his eternality. He had no beginning and he has no ending. Jesus Christ is not a created being. He has always existed even before he was born into the world. He's always existed. Secondly, coming forth emphasizes his coming into the world even before he was born. And we call these, in theological circles, we call these theophanies or Christophanies. Now, that's a big word. What does it mean? It's simply an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. It's Christ appearing even before he was born into the world at Christmas. Usually in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, he would come either as the captain of the Lord's army or as the angel of the Lord. For example, in Judges, Samson's parents, Samson, one of the judges, his parents came into contact with the quote-unquote angel of the Lord. But when you look at the clues in the text there, it points to the fact that this was not any normal angel. They worshipped this angel. This angel received the worship. More than likely, most scholars believe that this was an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. That's a theophany. That's a Christophany. You see, you and I exist within the confines of time. We were born one day, and we're going to die one day. But Jesus Christ exists outside of time. There is no restraint, and there is no confinement that can, be that can be placed upon him. No one can contain him. No one can constrain him. Number three, there is also clarification. The prophet is now going to clarify exactly when this is going to take place. Verse 3, it says, Therefore, he shall give them up. Now, the he is a reference still to Jesus Christ, the ruler. That's who we're speaking about here. And the them is a reference to his people, the Jews. So this verse is connecting back to verse 1. We're going back to verse 1. And these Jews have been overcome by the enemy. They've been overcome by the Babylonians. So they will be given up to their enemies, to these Babylonians, but for a certain period of time. They're not going to be given up forever. They will be given up to their enemies for a certain time. And then the text goes on. It says, until, until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. This is a direct reference to the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the prophet Micah is saying, when this woman, woman gives birth, things are going to change. And boy, did they change. This is why we actually have two sections in our Bibles. We have a New Testament and we have an Old Testament. The New Testament literally begins with the birth of, birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. When the New Testament was, was written, it, there was a change there. God was working in a different way than he had worked before. It goes on, it says, Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. 
Now, what is the end of this verse about here? Well, in order to understand this, we need to go back one chapter into Micah chapter 4, and let's look at verse 6 and 7. We use scripture to inter interpret scripture. So let's go back just a few, a few lines, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. It says, in that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away, and those whom I have afflicted, and the lame I will make the remnant, and those who were cast off a strong nation. And then it says this, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. So the text is saying that there is a time coming when Israel will be united as one people and Jesus Christ himself is going to reign from Mount Zion. This text does something very interesting, and I don't want anybody to miss this. What this verse here does, verse 3, is it links the first coming of Christ, which is Christmas, with the second coming of Christ. Usually when we think of Christmas, which is the first coming, we think of it as being separate and apart and distinct and having no relation to the second coming of Christ. But the two of those are related, the first coming and the second coming. They are related and they are similar in the fact that just as at Christmas, Jesus Christ invaded our world and walked this earth, he will also do the same thing in his second coming. He's going to invade our world again, and he's literally going to walk this earth just as he did the first time, just as he did when he was growing up, just as he did before he was crucified. The same thing is going to happen again. There are many people today who disregard Jesus, who curse his name, who treat the name of Christ spitefully, who have major disrespect for the name of Jesus Christ. And the reason they do so is because his physical presence is not here. People like to say, oh, this Jesus, I don't care about him, because they can't feel his presence, they can't feel his authority, they can't feel the weight of his governance. But I do want you to know that there is coming a time, future to now, where Jesus Christ is coming back. His two feet, two feet are going to touch down right here on planet Earth where we are, and he is going to walk this Earth. And when he comes back again, he is coming as a judge. You see, the first time he came was to be a savior. The second time he comes is to preeminently be a judge. That's why you need to make sure you're saved now. That's why you need to make sure you're right with God now. That's why you need to make sure your sins are forgiven now. That's why you need to make sure you're a Christian now, because when Jesus comes back again, he will be preeminently a judge. Don't wait to trust Christ as your Savior. Don't wait to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. It must be done now. When Jesus Christ comes back, he's coming to be judge. He's coming to be a ruler. As a matter of fact, we get a short glimpse of that through the prophet, not the prophet, sorry, through the apostle John in the book of Revelation. He gives us a brief glimpse into what Jesus Christ will look like, his presence, what it will be like when he comes back to this earth. John in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12, here's what he says. And I want you to think about this. I want you to try to imagine this in your minds. This is what Jesus Christ will be like. He says, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the voice of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and I am the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, 
and I have the keys to death and Hades. This is the royal ruler who is still yet to come back the second time. Number four, solidification. So now the rulership of Jesus Christ on earth is going to be solidified. Verse four, it says, and he shall stand. When the word stand is used here, it's speaking to the beginning, the initiation of his earthly rule and reign. Now to be clear, just so there's no mistake, Jesus Christ is already ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But when he does come back, he is going to be ruling and reigning here from this earth. And it tells us in the text, and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. Now we all understand the picture of a shepherd keeping his flock. But included in that picture is the concept of a pastor leading his congregation. As a matter of fact, the word pastor comes from a word that means shepherd. We learned that a few weeks ago when we were looking at the portrait of a pastor. So ultimately, there is going to come a time when the church, the body of Jesus Christ, Jews and Gentiles, will all be gathered together as one. And Jesus Christ will be the chief shepherd. He's go going to be the chief pastor, as the Bible says he is. So it is fine if we don't have perfect pastors here on earth. Because one day, the perfect pastor, he is coming. And he is going to lead his own congregation. Today, those of us who pastor churches today, we serve as under shepherds. We're only really holding on to the reins of the local churches of the Lord Jesus Christ until he comes back. Because when the chief shepherd comes back, when the perfect pastor comes back, when the royal ruler comes back, we're going to give the reins of the church of Jesus Christ united over to him. And he is going to lead his flock personally. And then it says, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they shall dwell secure. The they here in this verse is a reference back to the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ. The flock of Jesus Christ is secure. If you're here this morning and you are a believer, you're truly born again of the spirit, I want you to know that you are secure. Your future is secure. Your salvation is secure. Your peace is secure because the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ will dwell secure. 2020 has been a rough year. 2020 has rattled many a foundation in this world. But one foundation that should never be rattled is the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ and their salvation through Jesus Christ, their Savior. That foundation can never be changed. That can never be shaken. No matter what period you're living in, whether it's now or a thousand years into the future, if you're a child of God, your future, your destiny, your peace will always be secure no matter what. And then it ends by saying, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. So at the present time, when this is, comes to fruition, when this is fulfilled, his reign over the earth will be great. And he will not only be reigning from Zion's hill, he's not only going to be reigning in Jerusalem, he's not only going to be reigning in Judea, he's not only going to be reigning in the nation of Israel, he's not only going to be reigning in the Middle East, he's going to be reigning across the world. His rulership will extend across the entire globe. It will ex be experienced everywhere when he comes back to this world. And he will be the royal ruler as he has been predicted to be by Micah. So then, what should be our response in all of this? What are we to do about all of this? I don't know about you, but lately, and if I could speak for myself personally, over the past several Christmases, the more you think about Christmas, the more you think of the wonder of Christmas and what Jesus Christ has done, even by just coming into the world and being a part of this world that is so infested with evil and coming with the purposes of saving sinful people. 
Sometimes I get overwhelmed, if I'm quite honest. I think to myself, it's such a wonderful gift that has been given to a person like me. I get overwhelmed and I think, like, what do I have to offer? What can I, how can I possibly respond to the royal ruler? What can I do? And if you're like me, and some of you probably are, you may find yourself in the same predicament as the little drummer boy who went with others as they were going to give gifts to Jesus. And the little drummer boy had that same feeling. He felt that he had nothing to offer. And so he tells the story. He says, come, they told me, a newborn king to see. Our finest gifts we bring to lay before the king, so to honor him when we come. And then the little drummer boy opened up. He said, little baby, I am a poor boy too. I have no gifts to bring that's fit to give a king. And then he said, shall I play for you on my drum? So he went on to finish the story. He said, Mary nodded. The ox and the lamb kept time. He says, I played my drum for him. I played my best for him. Then he smiled at me, me and my drum. What should be our response this Christmas? How should we respond to this royal ruler? How should we respond to the perfect pastor who is still yet to come, who came and is coming again? How should we respond? Let me encourage you to do this, to go and get your drum. What is your drum? Your drum represents whatever gifts, whatever talents, whatever abilities that God has given to you. Take them and use them for the honor and glory of this royal ruler. Every Christian's drum is different. We don't all have the same drum, but if you are a Christian, you do have a drum. Let me challenge you this Christmas to go and get your drum. Not somebody else's drum, your drum. Go get your drum and go and play it for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is, without a doubt, the royal ruler. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this text of scripture this morning. We thank you for the prophet Micah and what has been revealed to us from your word. We thank you, Lord, that that prophecy has already been fulfilled and we can look back at what has been fulfilled, but also look forward to what is still yet to be fulfilled in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. On this Christmas, I pray that you would help us all, myself included, to remember Jesus Christ, who was the baby, baby who laid in a manger, but is still right now even the royal ruler. May we not be submerged in the world's thinking concerning Christmas. May we be submerged in the biblical thinking concerning this time. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would use this message to penetrate the hearts of those who are listening. And I pray by your grace that as Christians, we will continue to hold forth the banner of Jesus Christ as we go into every Christmas season, not just this one, but every Christmas season that we go into, because we must continue to proclaim the Christ of Christmas. Pray that you would hear and answer these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.